Welcome back, Trinidad Adams Tobago. Milka Sanatan is joining us as well as we have Shana Alexander Benjamin, and we're talking about the culture of rape in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, this uh, conversation stemmed from an issue that took place uh, about a week ago, and I don't want to harp too much on that particular incident because the fact is that it's not an isolated incident. Uh, these are stories that we hear all the time, but we also couple that with money, power, the perceptions of what's okay and what's not okay, the right to say yes, the right to say no. And it seems as though social media has given us all a platform to agree, to disagree, and to also be disrespectful. Good morning, thank you for joining us. Good morning, Good morning. thank you for having me. Now, you know, let me start with you, Shona, you know, and the, when my producer said we should have this conversation about the rape culture in Trinidad and Tobago, I was taken aback because of the description of it. Do you think that we have a culture of rape in our country? Yes, we do have a culture of rape. And what I believe sometimes people misunderstand when the term is used, um, culture of rape, and what that is um, defined as. And basically, a culture of rape is the is a term used to normalize the acceptance of sexual violence and rape within any environment or society. And this culture is enabled by unequal power relations, unhealthy cultural and social norms, which drive attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs about sex, sexuality, and gender, contributing to the pervasiveness of the culture condoning of sexual violence, blaming victims, and excusing the, atro the atrocious acts of perpetrators. Rape culture is perpetrated and enabled by both men and women. So we do have a culture of rape and is demystifying that and understanding what exactly is a culture of rape. You know, Amilka, let me bring you into the conversation with the, the culture of rape that uh, Shana talks about. If I ask, and I always, I always welcome you into the discussion to get a male perspective, mm -hmm. because a lot of men do not think we have a culture of rape. A lot of men think we have a culture of highly sexualized females, and that Caribbean culture is just sexual. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean from a man's perspective, the concept of a culture of rape? Well, it's quite interesting, because uh, I don't think I'll be able to speak for all men, mm -hmm. but what I could do is speak for why men need to be very active and involved in thinking about rape as a culture and not just an individual incident. Yes. And I think Shona Alexander really put forward this proper definition to see it is about the prevalence of rape, as well as making sexual violence against women normal. But it's this idea of gender inequality. We are trying to say that when rape happens or sexual violence occurs or the threat and the, threat and the risk of it is the legacy of a rape culture. It is not just an individual event. Mm -hmm. And yes, statistically, all men are not perpetrators of sexual violence. Mm -hmm. Likewise, all women are not victims of it. But the statistics show many women in their life will experience a form of sexual violence. And that is why we are trying to say there's a rape culture that exists that gives social license to men to act in that way and creates an environment of risk and fear for women. And men need to understand that. It is historical and cultural and not just an individual issue. Shona, do we still have that victim blaming concept? Is it, you know, I, I wanna ask that, is it, is it easier for us to say this is not true before we say that this could be true? Hey Ma, I really like that question because we have a system of belief in not just Trinidad and Tobago, but throughout the Caribbean and the wider society of the international world where we blame to excuse when we blame to excuse it means that we shift the responsibility from ourselves as individual citizens as a collective body and as state entities to act to protect and to preserve life and that um culture of victim blaming is also embedded in the whole aspect of a rape culture and Amical, um, Amelka said it great that is a historical type of behavior and it's not just a one-time incident because violence against women and girls and violence on the whole occurs on a continuum of behaviors and that blame culture is 
shifting the, the conversation from saying um, do not rape to saying um, do not get raped. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's moving it onto the victim on it's because you wore a certain type of clothing, it's because you were out late, because you were in the, the wrong place, um, because you chose the wrong type of, of, of guy to go out with, because, and it's always shifted to the victim rather than on the perpetrator to take responsibility for their actions and for us as individual citizens to hold ourselves accountable to say something and do something before the act of, act of rape occurs because there are so many small steps that we can do to prevent sexual violence before the actual act of rape occurs. Amilka, you know, looking at the conversation, tying this into power, money, popularity how does that change the narrative is it easier for us to believe rape um for you know I, i'm trying to, to phrase this in the most sensitive manner is it easier for us to accept the possibility of misconduct for let's say someone who's not powerful not popular not not as socially connected as it is for someone who it is um um perhaps however they think about the victim with less power, less status, and less visibility to their case. And I think uh, that is the thing. Sometimes we start to say that we are trying to bring down an important man, and if it was just an ordinary person, then we would have had a different attitude. That is part of our class bias in society, that when poor people are exposed to forms of violence, that is okay. That happens all the time. But when we have higher visible cases, there's a greater public anxiety, of course, because of a social familiarity, they are aware of the person more, and the positive attributes they may have had is now called into question. But you really point out a very interesting thing about this idea of blame. If we blame women, you fundamentally say they are bad women, either for lying or being a victim. The inverse is also true in that logic, that this is a nice guy and this is an innocent person. Mm -hmm. And that is why gender inequalities are so important in the way we have to think through it. Now there's a elephant in the room or the elephant in the Zoom that we need to bring up here, which is, yes, male privilege, but there's an idea that justice leaves people behind. And there's a zero tolerance, I think, in the culture to say, don't lie on somebody to put them through hell, which is jail. We still need to be very cautious about that because the same zero tolerance we have to lies and hypocrisy we must have for rape, I've been against rape and sexual violence. So we want justice. And if you think this person is a nice guy, then pray for them. Have a contribution and say, I really hope this person is a perpetrator. Because if they are not a perpetrator, that next person is not a victim. But don't get involved in a public conversation to blame people who have been victims of this throughout time. And it happens now. Rape is not a small thing. It happens to students at the university I work in. It happens to young women in secondary schools. It happens to boys as well. And we need to be very clear and make sure that we always in defense of victims might not in, be involved in this case, but throughout our country to care for them and to be sensitive to their needs and trauma. Now, you know, Shin, I want to ask you, I read this term the other day, toxic femininity, where, um, and it was actually a female writing the post, talking about it is always easy for women, or the easiest thing for a woman to do is use the, the rape card or the sexual assault card and you know, society tends to, to sympathize with the woman and demonize the man without knowing the truth. Is that, a, is that another concern in this conversation? Uh, Hema, there are many aspects to the conversation and that aspect of while there's toxic femininity, femininities, there are also toxic masculinities. And my, my, my ideology is once someone makes a report of a rape, you start by believing. When you start by believing, you provide and you create a space for that individual to feel comfortable enough to continue on in the process of the investigation. Um, and that aspect of women being attacked, not just because they are woman, women, but because also of their gender identities, we we take into into effect that men who are 
quote unquote, the ones who hold the power and the access and the control in our society are the ones who should be protected. And the women whose voices and whose bodies have been violated through sexual acts should be penalized for being women, penalized for being raped. This does not negate the fact that sometimes during the investigative process that one party, whether it's a woman or whether it's a man, may have been um, not wholly truthful in the process of the deliberation or the, the reporting. This, this is a minority of cases and it does not signify the greater majority because women and girls are overrepresented among victims and survivors of sexualized and other types of violence. So we also need to understand about this whole aspect of toxic masculinities and toxic femininities. And I use the plural there because every man and every woman is socialized differently. And while someone may say, I have never sexually violated anyone, I have never enabled someone to rape another person, our whole culture and language of violence is brought forth in the way how we relate to each other and how we treat one another and what we accept as normal and not normal within our society. So that, that whole aspect of toxic femininities is like a conversation that is on its own, but it's also one that is included in this topic of um, rape culture. Now, you know, I think both of you know why we're having this conversation mm -hmm. and the way in which our society has sort of jumped um, on either side of this. Conversations like this, what would be, you know, what is the role of persons like yourself, the media, and even law enforcement in changing the conversations and the culture? So I believe it starts with, with education. It starts with a comprehensive type of inquiry based learning and transformative change processes in that public education, where persons would now become critically reflective and begin to investigate their own biases, investigate their own attitudes, their context and their behaviors and to find out what is driving that. And we go back again to socialization, to culture and to how we as a people um, are socialized in society, how men and boys are socialized. And we, we look at this man box where men are told that they have to be um, aggressive, they have to be strong, they have to be highly sexually active to, to prove and to show to their male counterparts that they are men. And any type of behavior on the outside of that box is deemed as weak, is deemed as not being a man. So it's understanding what does being a man means to me in this 21st century and to begin to redefine and deconstruct your own masculinity to be able to create a healthy masculinity that creates an environment of nonviolence. You know, Amilka, let me also bring you back to the conversation. Um, you know, looking at the culture that we have, and we're having a conversation as to whether it's a rape culture, highly sexualized, but when you have um, industries and you have the glorification of sex on the whole, how are the lines so blurred that people just don't know the difference between right and wrong anymore? Yeah, I think you raised a great question. Um, whether people know what is right or wrong anymore, I don't want to assume that people ever knew what was right <laughs> and wrong. But this is a culture that really we need to, I think this is where the intervention I want to make. You know, some people ask me about a situation for this particular person in this case. I said, I'm neither a judge, a lawyer, or a see a man. I cannot tell you what the future is. I cannot get into the truth of this. But what we can do is have conversations. And I think one important thing for young people to question you, Rizima, is the issue of sex itself does not happen on equal terms. Mm -hmm. And that really puts a number of young men who may not have had the intention, but just didn't understand how to engage in the desires that they had in a way that was less harmful to women. And also for women who may invite a certain type of sexual attention to themselves to be able to assert 
their rights and dignity during that process still. Mm -hmm. So sex, we like to say our culture is sensual and sexual and so on, and it has degrees and people have the right to choose their sexual expressions, including a certain types of sexual aggression that is desirable and pleasurable. And I'm all in support of that. But we also need to really, perhaps, if I may say, meditate on the back shots and the pasa pasa mm -hmm. and the dagger in, in a way that still gives dignity to women still get, who are disproportionately victims of sexual violence and still gives justice to both women and men in the way that they could think about pleasure without eroding the rights of people. Mm -hmm. Now, Shina, you know, we're talking about dignity to women and we have such a culture of shame. Um, it's as though women are expected to wear this as sort of a badge every day of their life and it's become so easy um, to do that. I, I look at social media sites where it has become almost glorified. Is it that we just have no respect for women? And I'm not saying, you know, because uh, someone is going to email me often and say that you always expect women to get a pass. But I, I don't know if they don't understand. It's just downright disrespectful and disgusting. Um, mm -hmm. How do we then kind of correct that if, if, if it's, it's, so, it's so acceptable as general parts of conversations? We begin to correct that by having conversations. You know, Amilka made reference to having conversations and not just the, the talk shops, but action-oriented conversations that really drive persons to think about behaviors, to think about um, their actions, and to be able to create a space, create a society where all persons are valued, where human dignity is restored, where life and choice is respected, and where persons can be able to live to their full abundance and their life in a, in a way that they can own their own choices, own their own behaviors, and live in a peaceful coexistence with each other. So it begins with having these conversations, and sometimes these conversations are uncomfortable. They're, they're, some people don't want to have it at all because, again, it goes back to our own concept of how we view a particular thing. And I'll just quickly bring this example. A few months ago, I was invited to speak at a university session um, in Canada, and it was about the Me Too movement because on that campus you had an increase in, in rape happening. And I was surprised when I walked into that room, the football team, the basketball team, all the young men were out in their numbers together with their, their female counterparts. And when we had that discussion, I saw young men breaking down in that room because when we actually break down like, what is a culture of rape and how your behaviors go against somebody else's choice. We saw young men begin to cry and then apologize to their female counterparts because they're saying to themselves and to us in the room, I did not realize that what I was doing was wrong, that my action was against this person's choice because they're being socialized to think this is their right, this is what is expected of them as a young man. And so a lot of times people's actions, they are not aware that their actions are actually de humanizing and violating another human being. And the only time we can make the unconscious conscious and make the invisible visible is when we begin to unearth and have these types of conversations. I, I do want to thank you both for joining us. And uh, I want to say that, you know, we do appreciate that both of you have been involved in movements and conversations uh, addressing this. And sometimes it is a very taboo topic. It's not an easy topic to go against uh, what seems to be popular, normal, and acceptable. But uh, right thinking, Trinidad and Tobago does appreciate the conversations, and hopefully more and more people will get involved in it. So thank you for um, sh sharing your views this morning. We take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more for you. Stay with us. This is The Morning Brew.